We're live. My guest today is Jim Chang, co-founder of Catalyst. It's a fully permissionless protocol to bridge liquidity across all chains and roll apps. In today's conversation, we'll discuss cross-chain liquidity pools, Catalyst's design and security model. We'll talk about trust-minimized bridges and roll-ups as a service, MEV and impermanent loss in the context of cross-chain, their integrations with Neutron, Eclipse, and other chains, and so much more. I'm also dying to find out why he thinks crypto is just a bunch of theoretical research and won't be taken seriously until real products are built. Before we get started, make sure to hit the like button, hit the notification bell, and subscribe to get notified when I go live every week. And remember that none of what we discuss here on The Interrupt is investment advice. And if you enjoyed this content, please consider sticking with us. We're validating on Evmos, Quicksilver, Osmosis, and Juno. Just look for Interop in the validator set. And I hope you've booked your flights to Paris for this summer for Nebula Summit. It's happening on July 24th and 25th. It's two days of technical talks about Cosmos, IBC, the interchain, and so much more. No bullshit panels, no suits, just tech talks and workshops. The second batch of early bird tickets just went up. Go to nebula.builders for more. My guest, Jim Chang, is coming up next right here on The Interop. Hey, Jim. Hey, thanks for having me on. Hey, good to have you. Um, yeah, well, I'm really excited to be talking about uh, Catalyst today and diving deep into, yeah, rollups as a service, trust minimized bridging and cross-chain liquidity pools. It's a, a topic that I find really interesting and I think is really sort of apropos currently with you know the ecosystem of rollups as a service that we see sort of exploding across the entire interchain and on uh, on Ethereum and beyond. So, you know, before we get started, I know you've got uh, a pretty extensive background in crypto. You worked at Aave prior to uh, working on Catalyst. So, you know, tell the listeners a little bit about what you've been up to the last couple of years and what has occupied your time uh, in, in research. Yeah, yeah. Ha happy to give an intro. Um, so, uh, well, again, th thanks for having me on. I'm, I'm super excited to share some stuff about Catalyst that we haven't really uh, been talking about yet in terms of more details in the protocol uh, and and how we kind of see the the vision of of Catalyst unfolding. Um, my background, you kind of touched upon it uh, briefly, but um, I, I I've been in crypto for a few years now, uh, coming up on on six six years now, I believe. Um, and uh, yeah, my, my 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 passion has always been around. Um, kind of the intersection of uh, math and finance and and kind of uh, building distributed systems. And so um, my background is I, I uh, have an undergrad uh, undergrad degree in, in math uh, with the Northwestern in Chicago. Um, and I've always kind of been interested in, in kind of that intersection. And so uh, out of college, I uh, was a part of a, a big management consulting firm um, out in the Bay Area and essentially, you know, got exposed to, to crypto um, pretty broadly in kind of that sphere, right? 2017 Bay Area, a lot of ICO madness, a lot of just general excitement about the technology. So I uh, kind of focused my most of my time as a researcher at that firm, um, kind of working towards those, those crypto problems. Um, and then that was kind of short-lived, I would say, uh, in the sense that um, I really kind of got the taste of, of what the magic of, of crypto was and, and the beauty behind it. And so... Uh, decided to to be more of an operator slash builder, and so I joined Ripple uh, as a product manager, uh, and was there for two years, kind of building on the core uh, XRP ledger work, um, and uh, kind of seeing what it meant to to build kind of a monolithic L1. Um, and then DeFi summer happened. I kind of you know my eyes were open to the 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 power of uh, you know Lego blocks uh, for for money and smart contract platforms, and so. I left Ripple to actually just be kind of a, a DGen yield farmer uh, full time for for a bit, and then I actually joined an NFT startup called Unstoppable Domains, uh, where I was the uh, product manager there and also the head of their uh, dev relations team. Um, and then you know NFT land was was crazy. I think you know heading the JPEG summer that was definitely a, a good move uh, in terms of seeing where the where the puck was kind of going in, in the space. But uh, I wanted to go back into DeFi and want to go back into my research roots, and so. Uh, I joined Aave as the, the head of new products there. Uh, and so I did a lot of experiments, a lot of internal research as it pertains to 
a lot of infra work, like zero knowledge proofs and app rollups and, and interoperability and the such. And so um, that was kind of my foundation and my, you know, kind of solidification of that. This is something that I want to do a hundred percent of the time. And so I left Abe uh, a little bit over six months ago and, and, and started Catalyst with my co-founder, Alexander. What got you interested in, in this, well, this sort of emerging field of cross-chain bridges and rollups as a service? Yeah, I, I would say, um, I think what really set me off was uh, in, in this journey, really, uh, but also emotionally, <laughs> uh, was, uh, was, you know, this, this famous Reddit post uh, by Vitalik, um, you know, where he said that the future was uh, multi-chain, but uh, not necessarily cross-chain, um, or maybe maybe he said the other way around. But basically, the, the the crux of it was that like, you know, economic activity would be kind of um, you know, maintained and, and retained rather in, in kind of zones of sovereignty. I think it's what he called them, right? Like different ecosystems that had basically a shared base layer. Uh, and so Ethereum and its rollups is, is one of them. You know, uh, Cosmos and and uh, the app chains connected by the interchain. Is kind of another one, but there would never really be, you know, uh, too much economic activity that is moving between them, right? Because you kind of have to inherit all these trust assumptions. And uh, I think when I saw that that post, um, I was definitely uh, kind of like the contrarian in me wanted to prove him wrong, which is very hard to do. Uh, but and the IBC uh, maxis got up and they were like, "What, man?" <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. I mean, I think for all intents and purposes, it was like a pretty uncontroversial post, right? It was like, "Hey, like." You can move things across different chains, but it's just going to be not super feasible to do uh, through like different zones of sovereignty through different monolithic blo uh, blockchains. And so um, that kind of like got me really interested in it on top of the fact that, you know, Aave v3 when I was at Aave came out uh, with this feature called portals, which enables, uh, you know, cross chain lending. Uh, and you know, I spent a lot of time kind of thinking about portals, thinking about other pieces of, of catalyst, how you kind of enable at least for a split second, like some form of under collateralized lending. Um, and so, you know, it, it was a matter of like interest for me personally, but also like I, I applied that thinking a lot in my day to day uh, at Aave. And so that was kind of like, um, you know, kind of a nice flywheel, so to speak, for me to get really deep into the rabbit hole for this specific uh, segment. So, I mean, I, I think you, you've spent a lot of time doing research and you certainly do a lot of writing on Twitter and Medium. And, and um, you know, I'm, I'm curious why you think that all of all of crypto is mostly just theoretical uh, and that there is not much. I mean, how much of crypto do you think is just theoretical and and how much of it is actual real usage going on? Yeah, definitely. Um, I think you're alluding to my 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 hot take. Is, is that right? Or yeah, so uh, maybe not so much of a hot take. I think it depends on who you ask. But I definitely think a lot of crypto is um, a lot of thinking. Uh, and and myself, you know, I'm I'm definitely um, someone that is a fault of that. But a lot of thinking, a lot of research, which I think is really awesome. Right, a lot of the theory behind. Uh, what we're doing from a mechanism design perspective is super important. Um, I think there's a lot of kind of focus on uh, research um, and not, not so much focus, but a lot of um, incentive structures to continue researching more things because it's kind of what's being rewarded, right? It's like if you have a brand new like DEX mech design or if you have a brand new tokenomics design or, or gas market design or um, you know, brand new folding scheme for your for your ZK co processor, right? Like, that's the stuff that gets a lot of eyeballs and attention. That's the stuff that gets the likes, the retweets, that's the stuff that gets the venture money. Um, and so from an incentive perspective, you're bringing in a lot of people that are have research backgrounds are, are clearly very smart. Um, but their their incentive is to post papers and say, hey, like, look at this insane new concept that I'm doing, right? And everyone's like, yes, absolutely. Um, I'm not, not to say that, it. yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, not to say that they're not good ideas, uh, not to say that they're not executing the, against those ideas, but I think you get into the point where like, there's a lot of focus on these like novel ideas and, and maybe not enough focus on kind of the nitty gritty, right? Which is like, okay, how do we onboard users? How do we streamline this, this user experience? How do we, you know, create 
uh, sustainable incentive structures uh, to attract liquidity or to attract stake uh, for security purposes, right? And so, um, like that is that is something that I think it needs to kind of shift before we kind of reach or position ourselves right for for the next bull cycle or the next wave of of, of adoption uh, from the mainstream audiences because uh, that's the stuff people care about, right? And and quite frankly, like I applaud people that are you know, in the weeds kind of doing those things they are doing, you know, like account abstraction as a form of like solving the user experience or they're doing, um, you know, like data indexing as a form of like much easier data analytics and visibility into what's happening on chain. Right. Because that, that like helps users uh, or, or people who are even building actual applications like Argus is uh, an example that I, that I love. Right. They're building very, very intense infra, um, you know, they're building, you know, app chains on, on Cosmos, but, um, it's for the purpose of, of building games, right? And they want to build games that are, are fun for people on onboard kind of the, the next wave of, of folks. And so those are, those are the things that I applaud, right? Um, more so than kind of this, this new novel paper that people are buzzing about. Yeah, I mean, are, are you familiar with this, uh, this post by um, uh, Danny Grant and Nick Grossman from 2018, The Myth of the Infrastructure Phase? Uh, I'm not familiar with the post, but I can kind of glean <laughs> what the yeah, thesis of it, it is. Yeah, I mean, the thesis is that infrastructure and application phases sort of you know, follow each other in lockstep and uh, that they feed into each other. And, and I think that right now we're definitely in a phase that favors infrastructure building and that that will inspire new applications in, in the next cycle. And, uh, you know, we've seen this uh, like two, three or four times already since Bitcoin was invented, right? So even, even Bitcoin came before there was a Bitcoin network. So the, the, um, the application came before the, the, the infrastructure. And I think that right now we're sort of in this phase where a lot of infrastructure is getting built. And, um, but an another, another thing I think that bears thinking about when, when thinking about like the usage of crypto is I think we might look back on on this in ten to twenty years from now, and and actually, um, and actually th think that it was useful. Like when when we're in uh, when we're sort of in the middle of it, uh, it, it might seem like there's not actual much there's not actually much practical things going on, but it's all part of the process of moving to the next step. And and so I look back on the early days of the internet and back in those days or so like late 90s early 2000s at that time it, it didn't feel like movie blogging was a very useful thing or like early social networks were a very useful thing to the masses but they inspired a whole new way of communicating spreading information you know connecting with people that was necessary in order to get to like the next step uh or, which was you know, broader adoption of, of applications so I think that, yeah, with crypto, it's sort of similar where, you know, we might like look at, you know, all of DeFi as like a massive casino, but it's necessary to get to the, to, to the next step, which is to have like real assets on chain and more you know, user centric applications. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah. I mean, I, I would agree with that. Um, I mean, I think, I think it's always convenient to look at, you know, something where, you know, um, when you when you look back at it, um, you know, from like an ex post retroactive lens, you're like, wow, yeah, like that was helpful. Right. Um, but I think it's almost too convenient for us to say like, oh, like, I think when we look back, it'll be worth it. Right. There's kind of like a, a, a sense of optimism with it, which I'm OK with. Right. I'm, I'm OK with kind of that that level of, of optimism. I think I think you need to have it if, if you're if you're building the space and if you've been been building, been, bleh, been building the space for a few years now um i think what i'm trying to say is like the we need to celebrate and we need to incentivize more people that are trying to build towards what we want to be optimistic about right building towards these applications or maybe not even building towards applications but building with like an end goal in mind that is more than just like infra for infra's sake um you know, I think I, I, I see some of these projects that are kind of like super serving like 
the super users of like certain things, right? It's like, oh, this DeFi protocol. Yeah, like we're going to double leverage that with this crazy like staking mechanism so no one can sell. And people are like, yeah, "Yeah, I want that, right? And you're like, hmm, like maybe like 20 people want that, right? Or it's like you look at like ZK rollups and they're like, well, this is a Z, this is a prover that is more optimized for this ZK rollup that and, and and everyone's like, yes, like we want that. You're like, well, maybe like two teams want that and they don't yeah, have users, yeah. <laughs> right? So like things again, I go back to Argus, which I love, where it's like they're they're kind of like on both sides. I think people get really bored when you think about like building applications or like, yeah, like wallets, right? Like you could see an NFT on a wallet or something. Um, but Argus is really great because they're like, we're building games. People love games. It's true. I love I love games personally. But underneath it, they're still innovating at the infra layer, right? Like they're building these like sharded like game, like game chains that like all feed into some EVM based chain and using Polaris and they're on Cosmos and they have IBC. Like those are things that people get excited about. But like I want to applaud that because they actually have like an end goal in mind, right? Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um so you, you wrote this piece uh, a couple of months ago about uh, rollups as a service and that whole ecosystem. Can you could you describe what that ecosystem looks right now? Like what that ecosystem looks like right now? Because I think to a lot of people, and certainly to me, before I saw like this really nicely laid out graph that like has all the categories, it was also a little bit hazy. Yeah, I mean, uh, if I had one takeaway that I want people to kind of take away from this like crazy like mental map that's like categorizing these like 30 projects into five different buckets. It's that, um, well, I think there's two takeaways. One takeaway is that like this modular slash roll-up centric future is is here to stay. And what are the implications of that, right? What are the implications of people literally clicking a button and, and having a blockchain just like spun up for them uh, trivially and maybe even from a no-code fashion? Um, so I think that's like the big takeaway is like this is happening and you can see the projects doing it. You can see the excitement. You can see the venture dollars backing this, right? The second takeaway is that it's a very confusing and crowded field, right? Like 30 projects all kind of laser focused to do the same thing. And there's alliances based on ecosystem or based on values or, or what have you. Um, but the fact of the matter is like, um, you know, there's there needs to be some specialization or some, I'll say it maybe like consolidation that needs to happen. Or else, you know, if you're if you're this like, you know, application developer that everyone, you know, loves to talk about, I if you're an application developer, please ping me. I don't see too many, too many of those in the in the bear. Um, but if they're going and they're saying, "Yeah, I want to, I want to build a blockchain, right? I, I want to build a blockchain for for NFT mints or something like that, right? For my collection, uh, having thirty options is like untenable, right? Um, so that's basically like the two takeaways that that I'm seeing. But you know, if if you want kind of a, a more um, like a more direct answer to 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 your question of me walking through the ecosystem, I think broadly it comes down to like ecosystem alignment, right? And I think like that's kind of how I grouped it. Um, I think there's a couple ways you can slice it. One is like, okay, like, do you believe in, you know, like full modularity, right? So it's like, you could build an execution layer, you can even build a DA layer, you can point to different DA layers, you can have a settlement layer, you can not have a settlement layer, blah, blah. Or, or are you more like of, of the monolithic sense, right? And so like dimensions, like, no, we're just building app chains and they're all kind of generally connected to one another using the dimension hub through IBC, right? Um, so that's like one piece. Another piece is like no code versus code. So it's like, okay, are you an SDK? Kind of like the Cosmos SDK. We can like add in a bunch of modules and that's how you build it. Or are you like a no code, right? You're like, uh, oh, like here's a GUI and I just like, you know, like check all the boxes of the things that I want. Uh, and then I make it from there. Um, but then again, like like I said, I think it always just goes back to ecosystem. I think you can find similarities of thoughts and values on the Cosmos ecosystem around sovereignty versus an Ethereum ecosystem, which is around you know quasi modularity. Uh, and then if you go to the you know Celestia, Celestia is like full full modular, like pick pick and choose like any anything ever, right? Like 
more more and more modular layers are differentiating themselves uh, in the stack every day. But um, I think like that broadly, that's kind of like a somewhat helpful map of, of a very confusing picture. Yeah, what, when, one thing that comes to mind here, and you, you sort of touched on this when you were mentioning, you know, the, the choice that developers, uh, the, the, the choice set that developers have when picking a platform, you know, it also feels like, I mean, I hope that there's going to be sufficient demand for all these different um, security layers such that they will remain secure. So, you know, for things like Ethereum, I think that there will be sufficient demand there, but there, there's there's so many other um, uh, data availability layers and and uh, and sort of security layers that are underpinning all these rollups as a service. Will all of those survive? And then, you know, the, the next question beyond that is those that don't or those that don't have sufficient security, all the applications that are built on top of those will have to migrate or move somewhere else, you know, if, if, if that doesn't play out. Um, Cause it, it feels like the industry is moving towards decentralizing even state machines, right? So we have like a broad choice of state machines of, of, uh, of consensus and, and data ability and settlement. But what is the cost of security? I think will is something that's going to play out in the next couple of you know years. Yeah. I, I think there's like an existential, um, like problem that's kind of like looming over the space where it's like, okay, like number doesn't go up forever, at least, especially as it pertains to like security, you know, like, you know, also for liquidity, but let's, let's look at security um, for, for now. And so if our mechanism for security is literally proof of stakes, it's like, you know, how much number do you have that, you know, can incentivize people to, verify and finalize blocks um you know without kind of uh without violating the protocol or, or being malicious um there's going to come a point where it's like okay like we're kind of at this phase where finite amount of money that's staked in securing these these systems and a growing number of, of applications and value being moved on top of it and so how do you mitigate that right and so I think that's where like shared security becomes a really like uh, prescient thing, right? Uh, and, and people are kind of tackling in different ways, right? We of course have replicated security with with ICS in the hub. Uh, we have mesh security uh, that I know Sunny and, and the team think think a lot about. Uh, kind of more this this uh, democratic NATO like approach. Uh, we have Eigen Layer, right, where they're kind of restaking the Ethereum um, security. We have Babylon Chain that thinks a lot about leveraging checkpointing on on bitcoin as, as a form of security and so we essentially like they're they're forms of like leverage essentially which i actually don't think is a bad thing right i think with leverage yeah. comes capital efficiency and that's how literally traditional markets work right now um and and i, I find that a very fascinating topic uh and i think it's going to be a big lever we need to pull in order to overcome what you just discussed absolutely all right let's let's talk about catalyst uh because we could go on for this uh, sort of high level stuff for, for, for hours. What, what is Catalyst and what is the vision for the product? So Catalyst is uh, a universal cross-chain liquidity layer. I think the motive for Catalyst was born from um, kind of the acknowledgement of, of what I was talking about before, right? It was like, that we're entering this world of a proliferation of chains. And in, in that kind of end state of millions of chains, um, everything that we know breaks, right? Uh, everything, like composability of, of dApps, um, you know, all the infrastructure that we have as it pertains to wallets, as it pertains to RPC endpoints, as it pertains to data indexing, so on and so forth. That breaks, um, you know, managing multi-chain deployments breaks, governance breaks, so on and so forth, right? I, I don't need to belabor the point. Um, and, you know, recognizing that, um, we decided that the core issue with a lot of these kind of infrastructure or these kind of dApps is that they've taken kind of like a copy and paste approach, 
right? Where they're like, okay, like we did some work uh, for Ethereum or, or for a Cosmos app chain. Oh, there's more of them now. I, I guess we'll like redo that work and just deploy there, right? Or, or, or stand up um, kind of infrastructure there. Um, posts. Yeah, in, in a way. Well, I'm talking about more of like, like a sushi approach where it's like, right. yeah, like yeah. Let's, let's just kind Redeploy of settle it. to these different places. Yeah. Um, and maybe there's some learnings along the way, right? Maybe they're like, oh, like we can probably streamline our config and, and make it much quicker or, or we can probably reuse some components, but it's still manual work, right? Um, I think it's the same, same to be said for like Alchemy when they expand the different chains, right? Um, and so... Our thought process was, okay, what, what, how do we make something that's like automated, right? As there's new chains, it is trivial basically to be on those chains, right? It's not a redeploy. It's not, uh, you know, managing config. It's not a governance vote or anything. It's just, it's just there, right? And in that design space, we thought the most important thing was liquidity, right? Um, and so that's kind of like our flagship focus is very much like liquidity that meets you where you are uh, as easily as 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 kind of we see the future unfolding right and so so differently you know world of millions of chains catalyst is able to be in all those chains automatically and they're built in a way in which you can facilitate swaps with any chain that catalyst is on right and so it's kind of like this network effect of like, okay, there's more rollups being kind of propagated. Catalyst will be there automatically. And we can talk more about how that's the case. Uh, and the way that Catalyst is, is kind of constructed is that, you know, you have assets that live on rollup A. Rollup A wants to talk to app chain B. Um, there's a Catalyst contract there and you don't really think too much more about it. it you can just trade between them. You can swap, you can, you can move value. Uh, and so we very much believe in the concept of like borderless blockchain. You know, I think the analogy of like countries and borders for, for blockchains is, is pretty apt. And so we kind of want to dissolve those borders and make it incredibly easy to connect them together. Um, and kind of like this motive came from, you know, my time at Aave where I was thinking about what, what does an, an app roll up look like for, uh, for the products and uh, under the Aave kind of umbrella. And uh, one of the big things that was kind of holding me back was like, okay, great. Like we have a new rollup um, or we have a new app chain and uh, you know, it's hyper optimized to do all the things that we need to do. Right. Uh, it can capture MEV. It has, you know, optimized gas prices for certain opcodes. codes uh, has like our, our new, you know, a native gas token that is beneficial for, for the protocol. Um, well, how do we connect to our, our deployment on Polygon or our deployment on Ethereum or deployment Avalanche? And, Every team that, that we spoke to was like, oh, I don't know. You know, maybe you can do a multi-sig. And we're like, mm, like we've seen how Not that great. plays out. Um, and so, yeah, like we, we built it in a way that that can help those teams now, right? Now you can now you can spin up a roll-up and you're like, oh, like my roll-up spun up. Now what? Oh, yeah, now I can actually trade from anywhere because of Catalyst. And so that's kind of uh, the, the motivation and kind of uh, the TLDR of the product. So, so you 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 mentioned that Catalyst would kind of be there automatically, and it would be fairly trivial to uh, to onboard Catalyst onto new rollups. How trivial are, are we talking about? It? Is, is that something that rollups themselves uh, decide to do, or 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 is there some sort of you know central governance or you know, decentralized governance mechanism that uh, decides where Catalyst gets deployed. Um, yeah. The net of it is that it's up to the, the roll-up, right? Um, so the way that Catalyst works... So I think there's two, two kind of like layers to it. So it's like, what can Catalyst do? Like, what is it able to do? And then what should it do, right? And so on the base layer of what can it do, it can support permissionless um, deployments and asset swaps because effectively how it works is like, we can talk more about that in a sec, but, uh, yeah, there's pools of assets that live in each chain and there's a kind of a intermediary, um, kind of accounting measure that's being passed as a message 
in order to allow for the uh, the equal kind of transfer of value between those pools, right? And, and you know, it's a, it's kind of like a one to end relationship where one pool and, and one chain or one roll up can connect to the end number of deployments that we are uh, alive on on Catalyst. Um, so that's what it can do. What should it do? I think we give that decision making power to the roll up builders. Um, and so if it's a matter of, hey, like, we just want this, we want it out of the box, we want to connect to anyone, perfectly fine. If they want to be more mindful of, of, of the connections uh, to which chains they want to interact with and mindful of the expansion of that, uh, it could be a governance for them, right? For them. Um, and I say all of this within the caveat that like, this is kind of our somewhat of an end state, so to speak, where we can enable this. But of course, we want to be mindful as the product or as the protocol is deployed on testnet and then mainnet and then and expands the chains. Of course, we want to be mindful of, of, of where we expand and, and if it's like worthwhile time from a maintenance perspective. So all that to be said, like in the end, we'll have permissionless deployments and we defer like the expansion power to the rollup teams. But as we work towards that in, in our terms of our different click stops, um, we will have to have some level of like short, like diligence of chains we want to deploy on before we yeah, enter like a permissionless setting. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, that's just kind of a, the, the playbook of, of sound uh, software development. No, that makes sense. And so uh, I want to I want to just clarify first here for for those who maybe haven't haven't got this yet, but there is no there is no catalyst chain. Catalyst doesn't have a central a, a coordination mechanism uh, that sits on like a, you know, a cosmos chain or, or some other sort of, you know, sovereign zone or, or, or state. It is fully decentralized from the perspective that every catalyst deployment uh, sits on a chain or roll up. So that's one thing. And, and then the other thing that you mentioned, which is really interesting in, in, in sort of figuring, you know, building a mental model of how this works is that every catalyst deployment and every pool on ev every catalyst deployment. So let's say we have a catalyst deployment on Evmos and there is a USDC pool there and we have a catalyst deployment on Polygon and there's a Matic pool there. Um, and then there's a catalyst deployment on you know, Arbitrum and there's whatever their native token is. Um, all of those assets are effectively in pools with each other. So this is this one to end relationship. So I can swap my USDC for Matic and Matic for the Arbitrum token. And, and they're all kind of part of this one big um, pool of assets that sit on different chains. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So that, that's, that's really interesting because it sort of breaks the, the idea of uh, liquidity pools and AMMs as we've conceived it so far. If you look at Aave, right? You, you most most of the time you have this pool of two assets, and the, and and, the, and and there there is multi-hop. You know, for example, on Osmosis pools, you're able to sort of go through pools to to, to swap assets. But here, everything exists at the same level. They're all in the same like semantic level, and and effectively at the same. Um, level of being able to swap with each other. So, so I think it, it, it's like a novel design that I, I don't think exists yet, especially across chains. Yeah, definitely. Um, a couple points that that I want to maybe um, like shine a little, like a little bit more light into. Um, yeah. So just want to kind of um, reiterate that we are not our own chain. Um, and for and I think the beauty of that is, is that we have um, some level of, of, of credit neutrality with that, right? Like we're not being preferential to our own execution environment. Uh, we just deploy on, on any other execution layer and, you know, facilitate the transfer of value uh, between them. And so we're definitely a new breed. I would say we are a true natively cross-chain protocol or DAP, whatever you want to call it, app protocol, uh, in order to facilitate that, right? And, and we feel very strongly about, about maintaining that 
um, we may eventually have, um, you know, a home, but that would be more along the lines of, um, of, of, of like coordinating essentially like coordinating all the different deployments, uh, as opposed to yeah. having its own kind of like state layer. So it'd be more of like a, more of like a data layer, so to speak. Right. Um, but that's like governing the protocol upgrades and things of that. And that, that yeah, like, definitely. that's what one thing that having a centralized chain you know, helps with is that coordination mechanism. Yeah, definitely. Especially as kind of the, the multi-chain governance infrastructure uh, ossifies in many ways and allows for kind of that, that trivial, um, you know, upgrade. And I know Axelar think, thinks about that uh, a decent amount as well. Um, so that, that's one piece. Uh, and the second piece is like, we um, really believe in the concept of um, um, like, well, there's, there's a number of things, but uh, I think the system that, that we're outlining is, is, is capital efficient in the sense that, you know, every chain is just leveraging liquidity they have for, for the full swap. There's no kind of additional liquidity that's needed for some sort of, you know, intermediary bridging token, uh, so to speak. Um, and so that's, that's capital efficient, uh, and, and pretty kind of simple by design, uh, from, from that product, from the protocol perspective. Um, we also really feel strongly about the concept of leveraging native assets for swaps, as opposed to some form of like, a a lock-in mint mechanism, uh, that we see with other token bridges. Uh, I think by eliminating that element, we minimize the attack vector or, you know, minimize the, the, the kind of ability for an exploit that we've seen historically uh, by a, a significant amount, right? Uh, and so um, the way that, you know, we, we architect it by having native asset swaps is, you know, pools are isolated. Um, so you can only ever really attack a specific pool instead of like an entire contract that holds, you know, 180 plus million dollars of, of different assets. Um, and uh, and there's a number of other ways that, that we're kind of ensuring security, knowing that this is a very highly scrutinized field. Uh, but if you get it right, you know, it's 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 obviously going to be well worth the well worth the trials and tribulations. So explain how pools actually talk to each other. And, and uh, there's like different parts of that question. Obviously, there is the, the messaging protocol or the trustless bridging protocols that allows pools to send messages to each other across different chains and, and ecosystems that are perhaps not, you know, leveraging a unified messaging protocol like IBC, for example. So, so that's one thing. But but I think there's also uh, like how does um, how do pools get information about other pools? Because um, from, from what I've read, uh, Catalyst is able to uh, initiate a, a initiate a swap by um, without knowing any information about liquidity or of another state, and so I'm curious how that works. And you know, if you could explain also this this concept of unit of liquidity. Sure. So one of the design principles that we had when um, constructing the Catalyst protocol is. Um, how do we create the most extensible, lightweight deployment that we can in order to service this future that I talked about, right? Millions of, of chains and rollups. Um, and how do we make it the most performant that it could be, right? Uh, and so with those design principles in mind, um, you know, there's trade-offs that need to be made, right? Um, I don't necessarily see it as a trade-off, but um, I think, you know, from a, from a formal kind of theory perspective, it is a trade-off. And so Catalyst as a system, right, as a protocol, as a composite view of it, uh, does not have knowledge of, of the global state, right? Um, or, or said differently, um, there's imperfect information um, at what that's known for each deployment of, of Catalyst, right? Um, and how that effectively works is by removing the need for state synchronization between each singular deployment of Catalyst. It allows for a lot of the things that we talked about, right? That we're, that we're solving for. It's more extensible. It's a very lightweight protocol. Um, it is, um, 
you know, trivial to kind of expand the different things. It's, it's very elegant by design, very simple in its flow. Um, so, so how does that actually work in, in practice? Right. And so I always like to say that there's two layers to catalyst. So the first layer is, uh, the actual, um, smart contract deployment, um, which for all intents and purposes is, is just the math. It's just the math library. Right. Uh, and then underneath that, is kind of a, a messaging interface, uh, what you're alluding to, right? Like leveraging IBC in order to pass a message because at the end of the day, you need relayers to relay information and yeah, you can't yeah. do cross chain without it. Um, and so let's skip the second part, but we can talk more about that if, if you'd like to. I spent a lot of time thinking yeah, about of arbitrary messaging protocols um, and, and, I, and I write a lot about it. It's definitely one of the things I'm really, really fascinated on this space. Um, but on the first piece, right, the math, the, the actual, you know, the actual uh, contracts that hold the, the, the deposits, um, how it works is essentially, and like I said, there's no state synchronization, right? And so how it works essentially is you could think of each contract of Catalyst as its own kind of box, right? It has box, there's assets inside of it. Um, there is generally a concept for each asset like its own price curve, right? And so, you know, X times Y equals K, if you look at a pretty simple Uniswap V2 model, it, it's something that people are familiar with from an AMM perspective. Um, and, and Catalyst, we, we, we take that concept and we essentially apply it to, to each asset, but um, maybe we won't go there. Maybe, maybe that's a bit too complicated, but um, essentially you can think about, it, it's like each asset within this box has its own price curve. Right. That is and it, the X axis is, you know, the, the actual asset. And then the Y axis is, is, is less important in, in this case. Um, but that that's all there is. Right. So there's no kind of like knowledge of outside state of, of other chains. And so I think what, what, what's good about that is then you don't need to kind of keep track of different metadata that, that, com that comes in from different chains. And you're like, oh, I understand the balance of that the avalanche deployment or the polygon deployment or, or what have you. Right. Because then that becomes very complicated to, to keep track of all that state from different deployments. And so we kind of just get rid of that, right? And so how does an actual transfer work? Is that this box... Wait, oh, wait, I just want to I just want to stop there for a second because sure. th this, this price curve, um, I mean, typically in a traditional AMM model, the price curve it has both assets and the price of both assets in the curve. Here, we're talking about a single asset what is it pricing against? Um, yeah, is it, is it pricing against U US dollars or is there like some other kind of generic uh, price uh, that it's, yeah, how does that work? You could basically think of the Y axis as like held equal for all assets within Catalyst, essentially. Um, I don't know how much more I could share, but uh, <laughs> like okay. the way that I essentially like if you were to look at a swap, you would see that there's two assets on different chains, right? Let's say it's a cross chain swap, which actually, you know, Catalyst doesn't even need to do cross chain. It could do local swaps within its yeah, own box. Of yeah. Um, but, you know, let's say it's cross chain. You'll see that they they each of these assets have their own local price curve, and when you overlay them, like when you set the y-axis equal to each other, it forms x times y equals k, or or another very popular price invariant, right? Um, okay. So it's like a conditional almost. So that's why I'm saying like the y-axis doesn't really matter in this case, um, because we hold it equal and only care about these two x-axis uh, between the two different assets that are being swapped um sorry that might be way too theoretical but uh that's hopefully helpful uh if not no worries we'll we'll try to we can we can double click more into that um but essentially going back to my original piece so you have this box right you have these assets and so when they receive a message when they receive kind of um you know the, the unit of liquidity uh, message that that we kind of pass um they just they just take it right they're like okay here's like this universal accounting measure um and 
I know now that I need to withdraw X amount of units of liquidity, right? For, for this specific asset. And so you have this box, it receives this message. It goes, cool, three units of liquidity, whatever that means. I'm going to convert it into the amount of Juno that I need to deposit to this address, right? And that's it. That's it. It's, 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 a, it's a very simple box. And so where does that message come from? Well, it comes from the other side, right? And so in this case, let's say a user is trying to sell USDC on Noble and they're trying to get Juno, right? And so they sell USDC, again, another box on Noble. This one then calculates, okay, like you are depositing 1,000 USDC. Uh, that will be you know, three units of liquidity. And then you're sending that message on IBC to be received on the Juno side. And again, that whole process happens again. It goes three units of liquidity. Okay, I'm going to convert that to Juno and you send it to the user, right? Um, and so that's effectively how the math portion of Catalyst works. And you can kind of see where the messaging portion happens too with the IBC message passing. Okay, so assets have this unit of liquidity, which is a value that all of the pools can understand and convert back to the, to their asset. And, and, and that allows the receiving pool, uh, to, to figure out what the, what the, what the corresponding amount of tokens are for the swap. Is there some sort of communication happening between all of the catalyst deployments to um, agree on this unit of liquidity? Is that required by the math or, or is it not, re not required? And the agreement is implied with the deployment, essentially. Okay. Um, because catalyst at the end of the day is, is math, right? Um, and so that, that's where like the agreement is. Everyone calculates this, this the same way. Um, and so I kind of laid out the instance of like Noble to Juno, but that, that's a one-to-one -one use case. And again, like we're, I think the power of Catalyst comes in the one-to-many where you deposit, again, in this case, a thousand USDC and Noble and you go, you know what? I actually don't want Juno. I want Note on Canto or I want you know, Matic on some Polygon ZK EVM. And uh, you can do that. And you can see now where like the extensible design of the protocol allows for that, right? Because again, these are all disparate boxes that don't require any sort of, you know, synchronization of, of any kind. They just receive this message um, and are able to do so. Um, mm. So that's, that's where the magic of, of Catalyst comes in. So w when we're talking about IBC, you know, to people who listen to this podcast, it'll it'll be obvious how that works and how those messages are passed. But when uh, when dealing with chains that don't have IBC, so for example, like going from Juno to Polygon, um, or you know, like Solana or whatever, I mean, like e each of these chains are going to have some protocol or bridging protocol at some point, presumably that allows messages to pass so we have things like polymer and um like uh you know lagrange for instance who just announced their funding today um are, are is catalyst just optimistically using you know what's available or are you building your own messaging protocol at some point is that is that the goal or you just use what's there or are there any, are there any requirements in terms of the types of messaging protocols that you could use so there's no requirements. Again, we built Catalyst to be modular in, in that in that respect. And so, said differently, you know, um, if, if if folks are familiar with kind of how I how I view modular interoperability protocols, we outsource our verification layer, um, and so we leverage the verification of other protocols uh, in order to ensure the validity of the message that's being passed upon receipt, right? Um, and so we built it in the way in which we can have basically any message passing protocol and any verification method in order to do so. Um, with that said, as you could probably see from this flow, passing a valid message is the most important thing for Catalyst. 
And yeah. so we have a insanely high bar, insanely, insanely high bar for the message passing protocols that, that we're working with. And so that's why we're proud to be in Cosmos. We're proud to use IBC. If IBC expands or when IBC expands into other environments, whether through Polymer or Electron or, or kind of another team focus on that, we would like to use IBC. But if there comes a time in which there is something that is equally as trust minimized and, and kind of battle tested and, and scalable as like IBC slash ZK IBC, we are happy to use it as well. Uh, because again, we, we have built Catalyst in the way in which we can leverage any message passing protocol. So it's not a matter of can, it's a matter of who kind of meets the standard that we're holding for, for, these, for these protocol integrations. Okay, interesting. Um, so I, I guess from that, from that answer, we should assume that you Catalyst will favor highly trust minimized um, message passing protocols that don't, you know, th things like, like ZK, things like IBC, where essentially chains are verifying the state of each other and the, but, but less so the bridging of the, of the sort of, you know, multi-sigs and, and so on. Yeah, I, I think that's the most important thing for us. Um, I will say maybe as, as a side note, I think the, the ZK or the snarkification of, of, of verifying um, makes sense for every interoperability protocol. I actually don't really see a interoperability protocol that's not at least exploring that route. Uh, because they see the writing on the wall, they know that that's where kind of the technology is moving. Um, yeah. And so that doesn't preclude us from kind of working with any any of the popular arbitrary message protocols right now. But um, I think over time, you know, we're, we're in our of ourselves building security mechanisms within Catalyst that that may allow us eventually to relax those trust minimized conditions. Um, but as it stands right now, like we're, we're, we're very, very mindful of, of, of maintaining that high level of security with you know, the partners that we pass messages, messages through. Very cool. I, I want to talk a little bit about um, impermanent loss. And, you know, people are generally familiar about how impermanent loss works on, on an AMM that, that has buy two asset pools um how should we can think about it impermanent loss in the context of of catalyst does it introduce new dynamics for impermanent loss that uh, are not obvious no I, I wouldn't say so um the impermanent loss kind of um <laughs> calculation that you can kind of do is is similar to to what users would probably do for a balancer where you have like multi-asset pools um so with that said like we don't introduce any new types of impermanent loss outside of maybe you know whatever kind of um divergence that might happen from a from a cross-chain perspective might introduce um and but you know, I think I think the permanent loss that we introduced in the system is 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 similar to something people are already familiar with with balancer. And even then, you know, that's not enough for us. We can't just say, yeah, it's it's like the IL that everyone faces. Like we we think very very deeply about how we actually overcome some of those IL barriers uh, because we think it's you know a, a tough kind of problem that that I think especially as of as of late has kind of got a lot of conversation around, you know, how do you protect against IL? How do you, you know, what are mechanism designs in order to overcome it or mitigate it? Excuse me. Uh, we're, we're very much a part of those conversations uh, and, and we care about it deeply because I think in the long run, uh, IL is, is something that shouldn't be something that LPs need to be exposed to necessarily or should be compensated for uh, duly. So that's, that's kind of like our perspective on IL. And what about MEV? How is it captured and redistributed? So we we have plans to capture MEV within the system. Uh, I think from a philosophical lens, um, I'm definitely of the camp of what we call believing in sovereign MEV. 
So MEV that is being generated and extracted and or leaked uh, into a system um, should be captured as much as possible and harnessed uh, for the benefit of, of the protocol generating it, right? Um, so I think this is somewhat of a different uh, take than some other MEV shops, but um, this is something that I think we, we feel very strongly about. And so how we apply that um, you know, philosophy to Catalyst is essentially Catalyst deals with cross-chain. Um, it deals with a variety of different domains. And so it is a very new, exciting, and um, kind of uh, um, confusing and complicated design space uh, of like not only doing cross-domain MEV um, you know, calculation and, and, and simulation and, and therefore mitigation, but also doing it in, in an environment in which you're, you're dealing with more than two domains, right? We're, we're dealing with three, four, five, and, and eventually we're going to be dealing with, with millions of domains that we're connecting. Um, and so with that said, like the, the answer that I can give you is that, um, you know, this is definitely an active area of research that we think very deeply about. And we collaborate with a lot of organizations in the space in order to calculate and, and eventually capture that. But we, we do see that as a very uh, high priority for us and, and something that can offer sustainable yield for, for LPs within the system. Uh, ultimately, like what we're trying to do with the IL mitigation and with the MEV capture, amongst other kind of research topics, is very much like the, you know, ability to compensate LPs for kind of the the price discovery um, risk or, or duties that they take on, uh, and and making sure that there's sustainable yield in the protocol in the long run. So well, one thing I was thinking about it just came to mind here is, you know, we, we discussed earlier how, for, for instance, Opsmosis does uh, routing of trades through pools in order to be able to uh, access liquidity that isn't immediately accessible between, um, between two assets, um, or at least facilitate swaps between assets that don't have a pools. Um, that requires a coordination mechanism that I, I guess osmosis probably has within the protocol uh, with with catalyst will, will this be possible will it be possible to do multi-hop swaps across different domains and how will that work w would there be some sort of a mechanism that sort of has an overview of where the liquidity is and facilitate those routes uh the sure answer is yes um that we can do multi-hop and that we can do some sort of uh, some sort of route optimization. Um, the reality of it is that uh, it's not something that we are focusing on, um, you know, ahead of mainnet. But we do we do see the the value of doing multi-hop, the value of um, kind of offering the the, the best price execution um, for for users um, and. You know, I, I, I actually think that we can do it quite trivially. I don't, I don't actually think we need, maybe you were alluding to this, but I don't think we need like a central coordination uh, hub in order to do so. Okay, really um, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, I mean, obviously, like, it wouldn't, you know, I, I think the trade-off there by not having a, a blockchain to do the coordination is that some of it has to be off-chain computation, right? Um, that's, just, that's just me being intellectually honest. Yeah. Um, Said differently, like uh, instead of maybe saying like multi, you know, like implementations like multi-hop and, and price routing and, and, and off-chain computation versus on-chain, um, I think we're this is something that we at Catalyst care a lot about, which is kind of the evolution of um, like how we view a transaction where it becomes more of like intense and, and execution. Right, so I'm sure you, you've heard a lot of work on intense as it pertains to like Anoma and, and Suave and, and the such, and so that's something that we 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 do a lot of active research on as well. And so the intent for the user in this case is, mm -hmm. hey, I want the best price for for you know this this asset, and so we can facilitate that through uh, sophisticated execution, uh, whether it be single hop, multi hop, whether it be gas sponsorships, whether it be you know something uh, that might be cheaper when you introduce latency through some sort of like limit buy. So we're, uh, we're definitely very, very mindful of, of the research on intents and, and how we can kind of uh, implement that within Catalyst. Cool. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm learning so much here about how, how, how Catalyst is constructed and it's, it's sort of starting to come together. 
uh, more uh, more clearly. You know, in, in glad, the future, yeah. sorry, that's in, uh, maybe maybe a little complicated to start, but you know, it, it takes it takes cycles, and it, it it's it's learnings for me to explain it more clearly. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, so, in the future, can can we? So, like, one thing that I see here is that we may have. I mean, it's also also the case for you know AMMs that exist cross domain now is that we have assets that 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 live on different chains or different domains that are representation of the same asset, right? So you might have like USDC on one and wrapped USDC on the other, or you might have like wrapped ETH and ETH. Um, it, is it is the is the future vision for for Catalyst to, in some way, create meta pools of all of these assets to have even more um, uh, optimization of liquidity and 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 capture the best prices for these assets? Or you know, is this something that will remain sort of siloed on on different ecosystems so that you know if you're if, if you're swapping USDC, you're always going to be swapping USDC for like some asset on the chain, the destination chain that you need to go to, or will it, you know, would it be possible for Catalyst to say, oh, there's some liquidity over here. I'm going to go grab some of that to, uh, to fulfill this trade as well. Um, what, what do you mean by meta pool? Well, um, I guess like, so, Here's an example. Let's let's say you were going from from Juno to um, to Osmosis, and on the destination chain, there there isn't enough. Like you want to go from Juno to Osmo, or maybe this is not a good idea. But like let's say you want you want to go from Juno to Osmo the other way, right? And there's not a whole lot of Osmo in Juno, um, and and you're asking to swap more Osmo on the destination chain than there is on that chain's pool. Would Catalyst be able to go and get liquidity from another chain in order to fulfill that swap? Go go on another chain and find liquidity that is just sitting there on another pool of the same asset. Gotcha. Okay. Um, sorry, that that's slightly different than what I what I interpreted uh, meta pools to be. Um, but well, I guess uh, meta pool would be like a. a all of the Juno or all of the Osmo or all of the USDC across all of the domains, it just knows that that there's liquidity on all these different chains. And if there's not sufficient liquidity on a destination chain, it can go and pool liquidity from somewhere else. That's yeah. kind of like in my mind what I think about a meta pool. So the short answer is yes. Um, the medium length answer is that the way that we're thinking about like the five-year roadmap for Catalyst is essentially focusing on what we think is really, really pre like pressing and timely, which is this kind of proliferation uh, of chains and, and ensuring the extensible connections and, and automatic connections of all of them together permissionlessly. Um, the second kind of step for Catalyst, excuse me, uh, comes in the form of capital efficiency. And so there's a number of ways that we're thinking about capital efficiency uh, as it pertains to, you know, I'll share it. Why not? Concentrated liquidity, uh, rehypothecation, um, virtualized liquidity as a form of, in this concept you call meta pools, right? So, so universal liquidity um, uh, or aggregated liquidity through different domains. And so that is the yeah, next those are better terms to describe what I was talking about. <laughs> oh, no worries. Uh, Virtual pools, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's kind of what is on the horizon for us. Absolutely. Uh, we're making very, very significant inroads on that kind of horizon for us, right? Uh, of capital efficiency, amongst other things. Um, just quickly, I when I heard the term meta pool in, in this kind of scenario you, you outlined, um, I, I came to the mind of like, there are chains with canonical assets or maybe not even Metapool, but like Metapool plus you said, like the proliferation of different representations of assets. Um, yeah. and, uh, and I know, you know, there's some really good work being done with like, uh, ICS unwinding for like ICS 20 transfers, um, yeah. and, and such. Uh, but, um, my, my take is that like, there will be canonical assets that live on each chain as like 
that's where the asset lives. And all the coordination between those assets will happen, like, you know, said differently through like ICA, like account abstraction or, or kind of like remote controlling. And Catalyst will be kind of the infrastructure to facilitate that. Um, Got it. Yeah. That's super That's cool. my take yeah. on it, at least. But we're not necessarily building for that world. We're building for a good... When you build for that world, you assume like homogeneity. And we're not doing that, right? We're building for like a heterogeneous world. And so um, we're, we're, we're more building towards what I was talking about, where it's like capital efficiency through the form of virtualization. Very cool. Um so yeah, let, I've let's never talk shared a little bit that about, before. So, so sorry, I've never shared that before. I've never well, shared what we're doing in V two, but you heard it here, here first. You, <laughs> you hear it here first. Um, so you you guys have uh, recently announced that you're working with Neutron and Eclipse, and uh, just so happens that uh, someone here in the chat was asking about how you plan to acquire liquidity on your Neutron deployment. Uh, can you talk a little bit about those partnerships and uh, yeah, how you plan to attract liquidity knowing that, well, I think Neutron will probably have its own DEX and probably other DeFi protocols that are built there. Yeah, definitely. Um, and so we're super excited to, to, to partner with the Neutron um, team. I mean, you know, they, they have, not only incredible backgrounds, but they have a demonstrable track record of building great products uh, in crypto. And so it was kind of a, a privilege for us to, to be able to, to work closely with them on, on uh, you know, Catalyst and, and having Neutron be one of the, the first homes for Catalyst um, for, for our deployment. Um, and, you know, I think... I don't need to belabor kind of the the story of Neutron necessarily, but I think it's it's a welcome addition to the space that that will unlock a lot of uh, kind of value to um, to the interchain and, and the Cosmos ecosystem. And for us, like I think what was exciting about Neutron is very much you know what what they're bringing to the table and what is very exciting about. Oh, should should I pose or? <laughs> No, no worries. No, I'm, uh, I'm just taking a picture. <laughs> I, but um, I think what Neutron gets excited about is uh, is, is kind of again the the, the possibility of uh, retaining liquidity within within their chain, but still allowing the facilitation of swaps with with other with other sovereign chains and eventually beyond to Ethereum, uh, and and allow for this kind of like bridging ability as well, uh, permissionlessly, right? And so. That's kind of like what they're excited about. And I think from an ethos perspective, we're both excited about this element of, of permissionlessness, uh, enabling kind of a, a borderless blockchain kind of vision. Um, to answer uh, the question about uh, liquidity on the Neutron deployment, um, I kind of alluded to this, but we think a lot about sustainable yield, you know, in the, as it pertains to, um, you know, <laughs> as it pertains to MEV capture, as it pertains to IL mitigation, very active research that that we spend uh, a material amount of time diving into, and will will deploy with with Catalyst when it heads in the mainnet. Um, so that's kind of like our our foundation, right? Of 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 what we want to do, and of course, uh, you know, on top of that, uh, would be more of like an open point on on what uh, what incentives looks like. But I think foundationally we think that those levers will provide the sustainable yield that i think defi broadly has been has been looking for so what's the what's the roadmap uh what can people expect from catalysts and how can, how can people get involved today if they want to start uh, working with you guys sure so uh roadmap wise um very very uh busy month, I would say. Oh, you're welcome. I appreciate it. Um, I like, I like, uh, I like LCS's PFP. I don't, I think it's like rock climbing or something. Um, that's cool. Uh, but yeah, we have a busy month ahead of us. Like I said, we have our white paper um, that's getting peer reviewed and, and we'll release that. And, and with that will come a lot more of the details of what I just discussed very poorly uh, around, around the price curves and 
in the conditional matching of them. Um, we also have our test net uh, that, that will come out uh, very soon, uh, sooner than I think people will will realize. Uh, so that's 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 going to be. No, it's cute. Uh, scrolls are cool. Um, oh, sorry. There's a private chat, and so I saw it. Um, but uh, yeah, you, you are talking about the uh, the squirrel that is in the pr pr profile picture of the person who is commenting for those yeah. listening and not watching. <laughs> uh yeah sorry I, I forgot not always a video format um but uh yeah so so our test net will come out uh in the coming months uh and then uh, that will be kind of like our preliminary release candidate we'll have more release candidates over time we'll have quests we'll have you know incentives uh for our test net and then we do anticipate a uh late q3 mainnet launch uh later this year that's uh, yeah, great. And uh, I mean, I, I it, it's it's sort of strange to talk about a mainnet, right? When there, there's no chain, it's, it's I, I feel almost like we need other nomenclature to describe this this mesh of deployments <laughs> on different, you know, maybe it's a main mesh or something like that. Yeah, uh, but, Me but, but you guys could be the first to coin it. Yeah, yeah, we 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 gotta we gotta be better about that. I would say, uh, but uh, yeah, that's kind of. Uh, our, our timeline so busy busy nine or so months ahead of us great well really looking forward to seeing this uh play out and looking forward <laughs> to the test net or the test mesh uh and start <laughs> playing around with um with catalyst jim thanks so much for joining uh on the podcast today i hope those who were watching on the live stream learned a ton and certainly those who will uh, listen to this after the fact will be really uh, excited to learn more about about Catalyst going uh, in, in the future. So we'll link uh, to all the documentation, everything in the show notes so people can follow up there. Thanks again. Cool. Thank you.